All right, so what we're going to cover tonight is Chapter 2 of the NLTK book, which really addresses how one uses corpora. So corpora, or corpus, which is the singular term, is a large body of data. Okay? So we could actually think of any large data set as a corpus, uh, but generally when you say corpus, you mean text data. Okay? So corpora, being the plural, means we have um, multiple data sets that are used as benchmarks for uh, creating sentiment classifiers or part of speech taggers. And so we have these kind of golden data sets that we can use to create tools to then apply to new data sets. So uh, the CONLL is the sentiment one that lots of people use. Um, the brown corpus is the most famous part of speech tagger. So we're going to go over a lot of the different corpus options in NLTK, and this is going to take us a couple weeks because this is a lot of, of material. Okay. And so a corpus normally has material focused on one genre or one idea. So with the brown corpus, the idea is that it's part of speech tagging, even though there is data from science fiction, hobbies, there are categories. Um, the corpus for U.S. presidential addresses is in here, the Human Declaration of Rights in multiple languages, so that's its key facet. Uh, the chat corpus is tagged with different types of sentences, so it's a really good classifier data set for um, types of statements. So each one has a, a reason that it's a useful. Okay. So this lesson is really going to focus on what is available to you and how do you use it. Okay. All right. So we're going to get started with the Gutenberg corpus. Project Gutenberg is um, mostly known for their um, website where they put up free ebooks and these are because all of these are out of copyright and so at the moment uh, there are 59,000 ebooks in different forms um, because it is that they are out, they are no longer owned by any one person. So after 50 years, they go out of, of copyright. So you can read books this way. And on their, um, on their website, now we can access actually the corpus as well. You can view all of the available corpora that's part of the NLTK package by clicking on this link and you can look at um, a lot of these codes won't make a lot of sense to you until we really start to use these corpora um, like the tree bank part of speech tagger I know is a really good data set for tagging parts of speech um, but uh, word to vec may not make a lot of sense until we start to use it. You should not need to download any of them as long as your um, NLTK has been installed correctly. All right. So to use the corpus, what we'll do is we'll do NLTK after we've imported it. Dot corpus. Dot corpus ID. So this is in italics. Remember, you have to fill in the name of the corpus, and the name of the corpus is listed here. So. The Porter Stimmer is under Porter Test. Um, the Monolingual Word Aligner is MWA. I haven't used that one. Um, but if I wanted to, that's how I would call it. And there are other functions that we can use on, on each corpus. So the other function component here depends on what's in the corpus. So if it has tagged sentences, there is a function of tagged underscore sentences. If it has um, just sentences, that's just sentences. So it kind of depends on what's in the data set already. So here are some examples, and it goes kind of on forever. So we can do dot words, dot sentences, dot paragraphs. Um, words are just a list of strings right, that have been tokenized into words, meaning they've been uh, broken down. Sentences is a list of a list of words. Paragraphs is a list of a list of a list of words. <laughs> um, 
parsed sentences are something we'll use later. They're created as a as a sentence tree. And then a couple of other ones like file IDs, we'll use a bunch today. Alright, so I'm going to import matplotlib so I can make some pretty graphs. I'm going to import NLTK. And then here's what Project Gutenberg looks like. So to use that, I do nltk.corpus.gutenberg.fileids. And that just shows me all of the text files that are included as part of the NLTK package. Now clearly, Gutenberg, Project Gutenberg has 59,000 books. Uh, there aren't that many built into this corpus. But next chapter, not next week, but like the next chapter, we'll talk about how to um, import your own. So you'll be able to pull in your own Project Gutenberg text or any other text actually that you're interested in. Um, so we're going to use some of these today. We've actually been using these. Um, Sense and Sensibility was one that we had used as part of Chapter 1 as well as um, Moby Dick. Now we can save a specific text to use later. So we've got nltk.corpus.gutenberg.words. So this will give me um, Jane Austen's book Emma as a, as a list of words. There are 192,000 words in Emma. Okay, that does include punctuation. Uh, I could ask it what type it is. I didn't put print here so it didn't show me. Oh right, sorry. I forgot to restart. Here, got to rerun this. Let's look here. Um, the interesting thing about when you save these as NLTK objects, okay, so we've pulled the words. So you would think that the structure of Emma here would be just a list of words. Because if I look at how it prints, um, it certainly looks like a list. I've got my square brackets and then um, each individual word. Uh, but the type here is a NLTK corpus reader utility. So that will limit what you can and can't do with the object because of its type. Okay. Most of the time, since this is structured as a list, we can use it as a list. But if you ever get a weird error message, um, do remember that these are not technically list objects. They are NLTK specific types of objects. Okay. Um, that's good for doing things like what we did in chapter one, like uh, uh, not frequency distribution, that's pretty universal. Um, uh, collocations and similar functions need to be NLTK objects. Uh, concordance, oh, it's on this slide already. <laughs> okay, um, so one thing that we have to do sometimes is if it doesn't run, right, we will can convert it to a text object. So we'll take Emma and we'll do nltk.text. Let's look at what that changed it to. Now it's a text file um, rather than over here a corpus reader file. And so we can, that was really fast, I'm sorry. The original file type was a NLTK corpus reader file. Now we have converted it to an NLTK text file, and I can pull, I can use concordance, similar, and some other functions. And that doesn't come up too often, um, except when you go to work on like some projects or um, the there's an optional assignment that you can do that will help you plan for your final project. Um, and then you have to remember that these objects that you import need to be a specific type to um, run some of these functions. I have my face here. Okay. So this is how you'd convert between them. All right. Now here's a, a faster way to do almost the exact same thing. 
And this is more popular. So if you look at people's Python code, this will be more of, uh, of what they're doing. They'll say from NLTK Corpus, import Gutenberg. So now I can use Gutenberg without typing NLTK Corpus every single time. That's a little bit faster. So I can do what we did a minute ago, where I can print the file IDs. So here's them printed. I can save um, Emma. I can convert it to text, and now I can do Emma.concordance. And so I look up the word surprise, um, and surprise comes up quite 37 times. And I've seen this lecture so many times that that looks like it's spelled wrong. <laughs> so there are so many files in the Gutenberg corpus. How can we create a summary of all of their information without running the code five or six times? Okay. Now, I am not a code purist. Good code is code that runs and does what you expect it to do. Okay. So if cutting and pasting it 15 or 20 times is what you need to do to get it done, awesome. However, if we want to talk about how to make this more efficient, what we could do is use some more for loops. Okay. So you will like, if there's one thing you learn this semester, hopefully it's a little bit of corpus linguistics, but a whole lot of for loops. Okay. Because they are the bread and butter of Python. Which is sort of interesting because if you're an R person, People are like, oh, the for loops, you must apply everything. I'm like, but I love my loops, right? So <clears throat> we're going to do a lot of looping. Right. So let's look. <clears throat> what we're going to do here is create, create a for loop. Okay. So for file ID in the file IDs, what this is going to do is loop over all of those documents. So it's going to loop over all about, there's like 15 of them. Um, and you can see their names here. It's going to calculate the number of characters. Okay. So dot raw here is our unprocessed text. This takes the entire book. So Emma, Persuasion, Sense and Sensibility, King James' version of the Bible, as one giant character. So we can do dot raw. It has not been broken into words or sentences. And it takes the length of that. So that's how many characters there are in the book. The number of words is the number of Gutenberg.words. Okay, so how many words are there? The number of sentences is dot sense for sense sentences. And then now we're gonna get we're gonna get creative. So we're gonna take the let's work kind of outside in here. Here's one loop. Okay. For W in the words for in each file. Okay. So we have to tell it which part of the loop we're on for the first loop. Okay. So looping over all of the words in each file, lowercase those words, okay. and so this here creates us a list of all of the words in lowercase for each file. The set function here creates a unique list, and then the length function tells us how many unique words there are. Okay. And so that's a number of vocab here. Okay. Then we're going to print some characteristics here. We're going to put the number of characters to the number of words. This is about how long are the words, on average, how long are the words in each book. This one's how long are the sentences, so how many words per sentence are there. Number of vocab divided by number of words, that should be familiar. This is types to tokens ratio, it's lexical diversity. Okay. And then print the name of the file ID. What is the W? Great question. The W here is the second loop. Okay. So here we have four file ID in all of the file IDs. Okay. Here we're doing four word in words. Um, you could call it, you could call this cheese. It's a it's a placeholder, looping over every word. So uh, I think the W just sort of stands for for word without using the word words. Mm. 
because I, I am always careful when I write these loops, because this is a great question, um, not to use the same name here as a function name. So for each individual file ID in the set of file IDs. And so here is for each word in the set of words. So I try not to say for words in words, because then it gets confusing um, what is what. Perfect. All right. Run that whole thing, and here's what it prints out. Okay, so on average, the length of the words in Emma are about five characters long. The number of words per sentence is about 25, so longer than you'd probably think. And the lexical diversity is low. Okay, so that's not very lexically diverse. It's 4% of the words are unique. The most unique, I think, is Blake. Yeah, so um, Blake's poems are the most unique and most lexically diverse. And you see that the poetry items tend to have less words per sentence. Right? So here, uh, this, these are plays, Shakespeare's plays. So not too surprising that they have less words per sentence because they're plays and not um, uh, full books. Like they're not like uh, discourse prose, right? Uh, however, that rule it holds fast until you get to the leaves of grass, okay, which is sort of somewhere in the middle of all of these. I think technically they're poems, but uh, they're really long. Right? And so there are 36 words per sentence, or per marker anyway. But look, here's Paradise Lost, and he just goes on and on and sticks 600 words in the same sentence. So this would allow us to create a summary of all of the files from Project Gutenberg at once. So that's, that's a pretty simple corpus. Um, its only real benefit for Gutenberg is that it has a bunch of literary texts, um, and then you can also pull individual texts. So if you were interested for your final project to examine one author's texts, you could pull them from Gutenberg. Other corpora have things like parts of speech tags. So this is a noun, this is a verb. Dialogue tags, which are um, who's speaking to whom, okay. and then syntax trees. And we'll use all of these this year, um, and we'll sort of end the semester with syntax trees, looking at how we can create parsers that break down sentences so that you can understand entity-object relation, that sort of thing. So let's look at another one here. The web text um, corpus is a more naturalistic set of speech tokens. So um, web text is, I wouldn't really use it the rest of the semester, but it's, it's a shame. You should use it if you're interested in looking at people chatting with each other, because Gutenberg really is just literature. Right? And then the brown corpus is more formal writing. Um, and then some of the other ones we'll get into are also more kind of normal speech. Okay. All right, so in web text, let's loop over the web text file IDs. I just print them out so we can see what's in the corpus. Okay. There are chats from Firefox, from Grail, Overheard, Pirates, Singles, and Wine. Um, since that might be confusing on what the heck those are, you can actually type help web text because that's what we imported it as. And you it goes on forever. But it explains, let's look at it here. A little bit better. So in Jupyter, not on a slide, it explains to you what everything is. Right? And kind of tells you what some of the different options are to using the corpus. So the help page is actually very long. For uh, web text. And then this is where I can figure out what is in the corpus uh, as well, because they often will um, it give you like a list of all the available options. And if not, I would say Google like web text in LTK, and it will, there are usually web pages out there that explain everything that's in it. 
this is how I look up things that I can't remember about each corpus myself. Another source of naturalistic speech might be chat, the chat corpus, and we'll use this one several times. I like this one a lot. Um, so we'll import the chat corpus. Okay. And so the hardest part here is just knowing what this name is, but that name is in, on the link at the beginning of the lecture. So let's look at the file IDs for the chat corpus, and it's got this broken down by the age group of the people. So the 20s or 30s or 40s, and then adults. So I guess after 40, you're an adult. It's like kind of strange the way it's broken down. Um, there's a, one group called teens. So we could analyze um, speeches across age cohorts instead here. And notice that they are XML format and not text. And we'll talk in the next chapter about how to read text, XML, and HTML. So let's say I wanted to, to look at what's in the chat data set. The weird thing here is now it's dot posts. So in the chat data set, instead of sentences, it uses posts because it's treating each, it's like AOL if you're um, of that age group, or I guess uh, like texting now, um, kind of Twitter style where each time you hit enter of Slack, if you're using Slack, um, is a new post. And so it has them structured as post and not sentences because they're not really sentences. Uh, and then I just printed the fifth or sixth item up to the tenth <clears throat> with some slicing. And anytime in this particular data set you see these U and a number, that is not something weird. That's the username that they redacted. Um, and so these are just unique user ID codes. And so this one here is that someone was licking this person. Okay. Now this one has got a bunch of weird um, formatting to it as well. So it's like somebody hitting enter a bunch of times. And I think in this corpus, things that are and caps are specific codes, um, like the person typed, like clicked on a um, emoji that made it do the licking motion or whatever. And so I think that's what these stand for. All right, now the brown corpus. The brown corpus is everyone's favorite overused corpus. It is, um, it's been a gold standard for a long time. It's from the 60s. So it's getting kind of old. It could retire soon, hopefully. So we'll use it because it is very handy. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how things might could be better. Um, but forever, if any um, system was trained to do part of speech tagging, it was used, they were using the brown corpus because it was one of the only ones available. Um, so that's what we'll use. Uh, so you can see it. Uh, you can learn more about it by clicking on this link. And here's the manual. This actually was a printed book. Um, somewhere I have a copy of this book. <laughs> uh, as sort of as a nostalgic thing. I was not around then, but um, it was for a long time the only useful set of American English frequencies. And so we would um, use them in our data to uh, predict response latencies, lots of lots of things. So um, this was the data set that we used to understand word frequencies. Uh, now there are much better word frequency data sets and we're like, don't use the brown corpus, but it is very famous. So Coussier and Francis, um, and it has a million words. And go okay, go away, stop. A million words sounds like a lot until you realize that the corpus of contemporary American English has five billion words in it. <laughs> and so we're, uh, we, for a long time, we're using a data set that um, didn't even represent the entirety of English. Okay. Well, here we are. Okay. So, so far we've used dot raw, dot words, dot sentences, but the brown corpus also includes dot categories. And the categories are a list of 
um, wrong way, sorry. Um, they're a list of, of like, uh, almost like, what's the word I'm looking for here? Like, if you went to Barnes & Noble and they were like, fiction or teen romance, <laughs> which is a weird section to be in, right? Young adults fiction and young adult romance and um, cookbooks, okay? So those kinds of category distinctions. Um, and so we'll use these to talk about are there differences when trying to predict uh, parts of speech for one category versus another. So can I use fiction to help me understand humor, for example? Uh, so we can ask it for only one at a time. My mouse is being dumb. There we go. Um, so here I have asked it to print brown dot words, but only for the news category. So the Fulton County Grand Jury, this is the news. I can also tell it to print sentences. So here's the first sentence. Okay. Or that's actually two sentences. Here's the first sentence. And then here's the second sentence. Okay. So hopefully you're getting the hang of this. We import the corpus as its name. And then we can use dot file ID, dot raw, dot words, dot sentences, dot posts. There are even more options than this, but um, how do you know which one works and which one doesn't? I just try it, and if it fails miserably, then it doesn't work. Right? So if I did, uh, let's say brown, oh my gosh, dot posts, and it goes, yeah, no. Right? So you usually get this error message that the tagged corpus reader has no attribute posts. Okay, that's probably not right. But maybe tagged words, and it does have that. So as long as you know the list of options here, you can try them. And if they run, they're available. If they don't run, they're not available. Okay. That seems like um, pretty obvious, but uh, trial and error works best here. Or the help page, if it is in the help page. So let's, let's play with this just a little bit. I think this will help you understand how powerful these can be. Let's say we're interested in stylistics. Um, an option, what do you mean? Like literally the, the function option? Um, like an R instead doing like a question mark? Um, I have only seen the usefulness of help. And that just depends on what they've typed in there. Uh, I don't think there's the, the args option, you know, like when you do like ARGS, I think it's for arguments, is really only available on functions. And these aren't technically functions, they're data sets. Right, right. Um, these are not data sets in the same way. So. The thing you're talking about is like a data frame, right? Or a tibble, depending on your favorite flavor of R. Um, these are specific, here watch. They're specifically this kind of object. And uh, the only way that I am aware of, which does not mean that this is the only right answer, because my Python is like, okay, my R is much better. Um, is to do help, the help function. So let's look at Brown's help. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So if I look at it, it uh, tells me some stuff. I don't know how helpful this is. Right. Paragraphs, oh, it's kind of this. Paras for paragraphs, raw here. Um, sentences, tagged paras, so it, they are here. And um, this is the, uh, so when it says methods defined here, these are the internal functions within this corpus type. I don't want to call it a data set because I think that gets confusing with data frame, right? So tagged paras, tagged sentences, and then here, this is the options that you, the arguments that you can enter. Tagged words and words. Okay. Um, so 
So that's kind of your best. There is a lot of great documentation for NLTK. Newer packages, not so much. A great question. Um, okay, so stylistics. Stylistics is essentially linguistic style differences. So are there differences in genre or uh, writing style? So maybe I want to explore the differences between... Um, I always pick on Stephen King because I love Stephen King. So I'll say we want to look at Stephen King and um, another great horror writer, let's say... would I pick? We could pick somebody less or more action, uh, Tom Clancy. Okay? And we could, if we were comparing their writing styles, that would be stylistics. Okay? And for this particular example, what we're going to do is compare the genres on their use of modal verbs. Okay? Modal verbs are things like will, shall, could, and might. They express the likelihood of, a, out of the event. So I will go to the store is very strong. I might go to the store it is more less likely. <clears throat> um, and so let's look at how we could we could say if I said the question which data set has the most modal verbs or what are the, the distributions of the modal verbs. Okay. Um, I could import the corpus. I've already done it but I'm trying to show you the whole example. So I can import the corpus. I can pull out just the news text and that's just to show you a small portion of the data. Uh, if I left this blank here, this would pull out all the words. Um, I'm going to create a frequency distribution, but first I'm going to lowercase everything. So I'm going to loop through all the words, so we pulled out words, in the news text, make sure they're lowercase, and create a frequency distribution on that. Remember, the frequency distribution is just a list of all the unique words, in this case, and their frequencies. So the list of tuples of uh, word and then frequency. And then I don't want the whole shebang because this is going to be a lot of words, um, over, over a million across the entire data set. Instead, I just want the modals. Right, so just give me can, could, may, might, must, and will. And to print out their frequency, I'm just going to loop over it. So for, um, you know, each one of these modals, print them out, print out their frequency, and then put them a space between them so I can read it. So in the news data set, I can see that can, could, may are pretty, pretty much the same, but will is very strong. So it's used a lot in the news data set. One second, it's gotten like very hot in here, so let me turn on the air. Let's keep my door closed where I get visited by all the animals. Right now, I've just got one sleepy dog with me, and uh, yeah, it got way too warm in here. I was like, I'm gonna pass out. <clears throat> So this modal thing is interesting, but let's make it more interesting. Okay. Is that we could repeat that across each genre. So I could do news, then I could do science fiction, then I can do uh, bell letters, or I could loop over the category and the modals at the same time and print them all out. Okay. And then this is where I'm saying, um, you know, if you if you understand this code and you want to print out each category one at a time, go nuts. Um, you don't necessarily have to get it though. There's no um, right way um, as long as you are getting what you expect to get and you have it copied it from somewhere. So this is the homework that people normally will sometimes cut and paste from GitHub. Don't do that. You will get a zero. So just a reminder. Now you can use the um, notes, clearly, I want you to use the notes, but um, don't use the direct answer from Stack Overflow. Okay. All right. Uh, so instead, what we're going to make is conditional frequency distribution. Okay. 
I can't remember if we've done these. I feel like maybe we've done them a little bit, but just kind of if we even if we haven't, let's remind us what they are. So conditional frequency distribution is a, a is a cross tabs table if you're familiar with that idea, but it's a frequency distribution across different categories. So I've got all of my words right across each category. So you can think of this as a chi-square table or a um, just like if you were making this in Excel. You have word by science fiction and humor and etc. Okay. So it's a, a set of frequency distributions also grouped. And so I'm going to get word count here based on our grouping variable. And this is kind of like calculating the mean for each group um, if you're doing a set of statistics. Uh, but here it's a, a count for each group instead of mean. And so when we're doing conditional frequency distributions, we can separate them by condition. Condition is the group or separating variable. Here that would be um, categories in the Brown corpus. Okay. We are creating an event. The event is the thing that we're counting. Okay. And we pair them together. So what happens is we get the category. It might be news. It might be romance. And then we get the words themselves. So here in the news data set, we might see um, war, right? And then in a romance text, you might see the word love. And so we create a frequency for each of those combinations. And so we end up with this list object that is structured in uh, tuples and not just pairs. So let's try that. So the conditional frequency distribution function, so I guess we haven't talked about this. Sometimes it's hard to keep it straight because I've also, I'm also teaching this class in late spring, so sometimes the crossover, I can't quite remember. Um, but the conditional frequency distribution function takes these um, pairs of like category and word or whatever it might be and kind of creates an internal loop okay, to make that frequency distribution for you. And the way I think about this is it's a function that does separate by this and count that. Okay, so separate by condition and count event. <clears throat> and then you're creating a frequency distribution on those events. Okay, so let's look at how this works internally. We have NLTK dot conditional freak dist, dist instead of just freak dist. There are two things to loop over. And so when a conditional frequency distribution is expecting two. So the second argument here ends up being a tuple of the things that it is expecting to split by. It actually can be more than two, but we're going to stick with two to keep our brains nice and neat. So this, this first argument is a, a tuple, right? That's what the parentheses mean, of two things that you are going to um, to. Uh, separate by and then count by. So separate by this. Oops, sorry. This here is separate by genre. Count that. Count the words. Okay. Then the next is the loop. Okay. So for the genre and the categories. So loop over those categories. Okay. Then the next argument is the words. And loop over all of those words within each genre. And so that loop on the last line is building from this previous line. Okay, this is an embedded loop. It doesn't look embedded because it's not tabbed over, but that's because it's all part of this larger um, conditional frequency distribution function. So this is, um, this is the structure of the arguments for this function. And then tell it to print. Well, printing didn't do a whole lot. It's like, Hey, <laughs> there's stuff in here. So we have to figure out a different way to print these because they don't just print because of the type of data they are. Um, so what we'll do is we'll either plot them, so use dot plot or dot tabulate to um, print this stuff out. Okay. Now with, with a regular just freak dist, you can just print that because it's a list of tuples. This, however, is like a list of 
tuples by category. So it's it's kind of a multiple lists. So if you're an R person, this would be a list of lists. Okay. Um, and Python doesn't represent that quite the same way. So what we need to do is find a way to print that out. And these have arguments, conditions, and samples. I wish these argument names were the same idea as our um, condition and event, but it's not. <laughs> so conditions and the samples. And what I'm going to do is put in uh, for condition, my fault, sorry, um, genre here, and then the samples are the words. If you omit them, you're going to get every possible combination. This is every word by every genre, which might be what you're interested in, but that's not going to print out very well because that's going to be this giant table of genre across the top by word down the bottom or reversed. And you're going to be sad because it's going to be huge. Okay. Um, and so we're probably going to plot or tabulate only a small section of a conditional frequency distribution if there are a lot of categories. So now let's, let's, let's print it. Okay, so here we're going to put in the conditions. And I told it to print only these genres. This is not every genre available in the brown corpus. Um, just a couple of them. And then our modals. So I only want to see can, could, may, might, must, and will. Okay, I don't want to see every word, I just want to see the modals. So the function here, CFD, is our conditional frequency distribution we created. That CFD has every word by every genre. However, we're going to use a subset basically and tell it we only want these genres and we only want these words. Now this is much more interesting. Um, when looking at these, can I use these five or six words to predict what category a text is going to be? Okay. So part of sentiment, um, the idea behind sentiment analysis is that it's a classifier. So we're going to classify documents as positive or negative or male or female or uh, the type of document it is. So I, I think thinking about sentiment in this narrow view of it's just emotion is not nearly as much fun as thinking about a classification. Like the purpose of this class is to teach you how to build up to classification, right? Um, and that classification could be happy and sad. Okay. Um, there's so much more to NLP than that, though. <laughs> like That is like the very narrow view of what you can do with text. I might be interested in giving it a category label so that I know um, how to classify it for like a keyword tag. right? Or um, let's say I'm an action editor at a journal, and I get this abstract. And so who do I know how to, who to send it to? Like, How do I find a reviewer for this paper? Well, this is clearly a statistics paper, so I need to send this to reviewers whose categories are listed as statistics. And that's literally how that works. <laughs> so when people submit their papers, you often will pick keywords from the journal system, not the ones that you make up. Um, and then part of the suggested reviewers will be people who have picked that those keywords are their specialties. Okay. So this is why I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I get plenty of people asking me to review papers for it because they're doing something really math heavy. And I am a, that is my specialty of structural equation modeling, for example. Um, but if I'm trying to do that automatically with a classification system, could I use modal verbs as a classifier? Okay. And that may not work well for science papers, but it does work very well in the Brown Corpus, because check it out. Under news, will is super frequent. Um, under hobbies, we get a nice even split between can, will, and a little bit under may. Okay. Science fiction has almost no modal verbs. Humor has almost no modal verbs. But oh man, under romance, it's could. Okay. So we could use these distributions to pick a probability of what a um, document's going to be simply by looking at their modal verbs which is not even the most interesting thing in a text, usually. Okay. And so that's why um, I think natural language processing is so powerful, is that we have these examples, 
of these in these differences in writing stylistics um, that are actually very predictive. So we don't have to build these crazy machine learning artificial intelligence systems when half the time a very simple log regression will do, <laughs> right? So you could um, say, well, the prior probability, if it uses the word will, it's going to be a news article more than likely than anything else. So some other things we can do with CFD uh, is conditions. Okay, is that conditions? You can put the name of the condition in the square brackets and get just that condition. So if we wanted only the news. If we want only the number of times the news and the word war, war appeared, tabulate so we just did. Um, tabulate only a few things we just did. Plot, we can make plots. We can also make plots of only a few things. So there's lots of cool functionality that we can pull. If you're a more traditional programmer, um, like Perl, C++, um, maybe Java, not PHP. Anyways, this is basically a, a hash if you used a Perl or an array of how that's structured. Okay. So I don't want to call this a data set because it's not a data frame like we think of data frames if you're an R person. Um, but this is more of a traditional array. Okay. What about the Re Reuters corpus? Okay. This is a news corpus, so it's got a million and point three words, and it's a really good classification um, corpus for a sort of topic discovery. Uh, so there are a whole series of analyses called topics models that help you discover the underlying topics in the document to help you classify them. But the Reuters corpus also allows you to do this with um, like a naive Bayes classifier where we're trying to train a classifier on some previous data and move it on to the, um, other models. Okay. So the brown corpus has like category labels. Um, the Reuters corpus actually has more like category tags. So these are more like keywords. Um, and each one is classified under multiple keywords. Whereas the round corpus is, is like, this is news, this is science fiction. They don't overlap. Uh, so if I look at the categories, uh, they're crazy. <laughs> they're literally nuts. Uh, alum, barley, bop, <laughs> castor oil. It's just, just weird. There's an entire article about castor oil, coconut oil, coconuts, coffee. <laughs> like, they're like, they're more of a keyword system. Right? Um, the file IDs are like some weird names that they have. Okay. Uh, and if it says test in front of it, that's because it's usually part of the testing in the models rather than the training. Um, so we could use the names of the objects under categories to get just this particular file. And so the categories for this very specific file are barley, corn, grain, and wheat. The categories for these two particular files are barley, corn, grain, and wheat, and money. So they're very different. I could tell it to tell me all of the files that are about barley. <laughs> This makes me laugh because I'm like, oh, who writes this much about wheat? But here we go. Okay. Uh, actually, most good statistics are based on um, uh, agriculture, wheat crop products. So can't talk too much, right? That's uh, students' tea was based on making better beer. Okay. Um, and then this last one is how many of them are about barley and corn. And here's the overlap between the two. So this would be good if you were interested in specific keywords that you wanted to learn more about. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. Um, we can find individual words by building little mini lists here. So I can tell it to give me the words for these two files. And so we've got French free market cereal exports. If the words are in uppercase, that usually denotes that it's the title of whatever's going on, the book, or the article, the news. If it's in lowercase or proper case, it's the actual text. 
And then here's everything about coffee, because I love coffee, Indonesian Commodity Exchange. Um, so I could pull all of the words that are in this category of coffee to see what is different than maybe the category of corn. And my mouse is slowly losing it. The inaugural address corpus we've actually used already. We used in lesson one. Um, but now we can do something much cooler with it. Now we have some Python skills. Um, we can take those addresses and instead of just treating them as one giant lexical trend plot, we did a, um, a, a lexical dispersion plot. Um, we can actually uh, create plots across time. Okay. So we're going to use a little bit of slicing and a little bit of for loops. We're going to import the inaugural address corpus. Uh, here are all the file IDs. And the nice thing about these file IDs is they're all structured the same way. The first four characters, so 0, 1, 2, 3, are the year, then who gave it. Uh, excuse me. Oh, excuse me. What well, that means I can do is tell it to pull the first four characters, so 0 up through, up to 4, does not include 4. Um, first four characters in those file IDs looping over them. And it's told it to print the first five, and it actually is down here at the bottom. I can't see it. Um, that's handy because now I can create a conditional frequency distribution. Okay. Remember that it takes two items, so I'm going to call this target. This is my target word. I could call, again, I could call this cheese or um, uh, any random word, zoo, any word you want. But right here it's our targets that we're looking for. Then the, um, uh, remember it's, uh, here we're separating by year. I'm going to loop over the file IDs. Okay, so for file ID in those file IDs, so loop over those file IDs loop over those words and then only count the number of times that it's either American or citizen. So here's something new. Okay. This other piece we've done previously. And that's basically saying when you see the word American or you see the word citizen, count it up. Okay. If it is lowercase and starts with target. Okay. This is really sneaky. It's really interesting because what we're going to do is lowercase the word American especially, right? So we're, we're lowering them. Remember the W here is each individual word. And starts with. Starts with is cool because now I'm going to get American, America, American, Americans, um, any form of America plus other symbols. And this can be citizen or citizenship or citizens with the S. So this this is really nice because it allows you to get the all the different forms of the same word. I'm gonna tell that to plot. Uh, I'm gonna tell my plot to be bigger than two inches wide, and then I'm going to plot it. So this down here across the bottom is time. I've left out conditions and samples because I want everything, right? So our conditions here are the, the years, our samples are the two words, and now I can look at the use of each word across time. Okay. What we did before was we made a picture of the use of each word across words in the document, which were organized by time, but, <clears throat> excuse me, this is now at least collapsed by each speech. Um, it does pick the colors, but you can you can edit them. I don't remember if you edit them in the matplotlib section or if you can do it in plot. Sorry, that's R. If you do it like that, okay. yeah. So in help, oh wow, that is useless. Okay, so the help for that one is totally useless. <laughs> Um, let's just see. Oh, 
Let's see what Stack Overflow says. Oh, oh, okay, PLT. Okay, so we are using Python here. I, I meant to type Python. You do color arguments. Okay, so it looks like you might have to uh, line, set the color line. So it's actually part of the matplotlib, which is, if you're familiar with ggplot, is gigantic, just like ggplot. The question is, it can you? It's how? How? Um, so this kind of action where you're setting the colors based on maybe like this kind of get lines code. Let me see if I can just do it. Right? Probably not. Dot GCA. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what this is. We might have to save the plot and then like color it and then print it back out. This would be my best guess. All right. There's that plot. But what do we see in the plot? You know, blue and orange aside here. Um, I'm just happy if you can make the plot right now. Uh, so here, because I, if I were to do this plot, I would take all, all these gray lines. I hate them. But anyway. Uh, what we see is that citizen is much more important, especially if you look at it, it's like 1840s, right? So that's much more important. America comes up here in the 1920s, right, during the Depression era, and then citizen just kind of like drops off. I bet we would see this a lot more now because of the um, border arguments, but America is much more like of a big deal, right? You see it especially peak during the bicentennial, and then it becomes more and more important. And I'm sure now, if we had sort of some of Trump's uh, speeches in this document, which we don't, um, it would be even higher right? because of the uh, presidential slogans and because of the immigration focus right now. Um, but that's really cool to know, to see that those two things are very different. All right. The whole list of corpora includes them, a lot of these other pieces, like parts of speech, tags, semantic roles, syntax, there's just an incredible amount of stuff in there, and you can kind of look at the book chapter to see what is in each one, and it kind of gives you a clue as to what um, is possible in the data set. Okay. So the pronunciation dictionary clearly has phonetics in it. The chunking dictionary is tagged. I think as you go this semester, you'll learn a lot more what these words mean. So when you see tagged, that means part of speech. Okay. When you see chunked, that's going to be chapter 8. Okay. Um, so here's just some examples of what like the Swadesh corpus is a comparative word list. Um, the uh, since vowel corpus is more about since tagging. So words that may have multiple meanings are tagged, special. <clears throat> All right. Don't want to keep talking about English. Unfortunately, you're stuck with me, so we're not. But um, it's not even the most spoken language in the world. But it's probably the most well-researched, for show. So we have mostly English corpora, but um, there are other ones. And... In the next chapter, we're going to talk about how to deal with character sets that you may not have on your computer, or your computer may not know how to process. So without telling my computer um, uh, about, uh, let's say, Chinese, um, so or um, Cyrillic, or it's another Pictionary language, uh, Arabic, right? I might have trouble. Um, because the symbols might not show up properly, or my computer might not know how to handle those symbols. Um, and we'll talk about how to do Unicode in the next chapter. And then I've got these uh, commented out because I don't have them downloaded, but you can actually download these with that nltk.download um, and pick corpora and other language, other languages. So specifically, let's talk a little bit about multiple languages. The um, UDHR, it's a human Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
I'm going to do this real quick so we can see both slides effectively. Okay. It's in 300 languages. And the purpose of this corpus is to allow having the same text with hopefully the same meaning in, in different word, in different languages, so you can understand how things that are semantically similar, they mean the same thing, are related. Okay. And so a very simple example is just look at word links. So some languages have lots of short words. English is definitely one of those. Um, some languages love to combine words. So some of the European languages, like I swear, I'm just like, that has 700 letters. What does that even mean, right? Um, and so let's see if we can find those trends. So I'm going to import UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We're going to pull in these specific languages, Chickasaw, English, German, um, a Eskimo language from Greenland, uh, Hungarian, and I think this is a different Eskimo language. Uh, no, it's a, um, looks like an African language. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm only going to pull those. We're going to use conditional frequency distribution again to get you guys used to it. We've got two conditions, what language it is and how long are the words. So we're going to tell it to give us the link back. So this is our event. The thing we're calculating is not word frequency anymore. Now it's the length frequency, the frequency of links. Okay. Loop over the language in languages here. Loop over the words. And very specifically, I'm converting these to Latin. Okay, we'll cover this more in the next chapter about how to convert between um, encoding types. Okay. And so what this is going to give me back is a frequency distribution of each language and each word link. So um, English here has seven two-letter words and six three-letter words and eight four-letter words, whereas Chickasaw has no two-letter words and eight four-letter words, that kind of thing. And I'm going to plot that. So across the bottom here, where it says samples, this is the length of the word. So this is one-letter words, two-letter words, three-letter words, yada, 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 yada. This is a cumulative plot. So um, large jumps mean that there's a lot of those types of words. And the fascinating thing here is looking at which ones when they asymptote. Right? So the Ibibo language um, has lots of short words. Okay? It is almost predominantly less than five letters. Okay? English follows next. We have a lot of short words. Okay? Followed by German and the purple one, which is Hungarian. Then the blue one, which is Chickasaw, and then the uh, Eskimo language, right, um, which has lots of long words. Okay. Now, uh, I can't really look at the word count. I could also look at word count, right? So how, um, how many words does it take the language to say the same thing? And so when you have lots of short words, it takes a lot more of them than when you have lots of long words. Right? So part of what's happening here is that the languages with the longer words are probably smooshing them together. Okay? And so in some languages, um, different ideas are formed by combining words rather than just using more words. Okay? English is just word soup. Just add more words till it makes sense. Uh, the, the, at this point, we're going to talk about structure of these corpus um, files. Okay. So they, if we're taking and we're creating a corpus, let's say, these can be structured in a bunch of different ways. Okay. We could just, here's all the words, good luck. Here's the raw text file, do whatever you want with it. Okay. We could categorize them. When you have cat, there's a little picture down here too. When you have categor categorized data, it is this or that and no overlap, right? It is this thing or that thing. Um, so technically, the uh, 
inaugural address corpus is categorized by who gave the speech. Um, and the Gutenberg corpus is categorized by uh, book and author. An overlapping corpus is more of a keywords corpus, and that's like Reuters, um, where the categories can overlap. So we can talk about coffee and cheese in the same article. And then the inaugural address corpus is actually better explained as a temporal corpus where it's uh, categorized by time instead of topic. And so the purpose of talking about this is to know which corpus to use when. Okay? And so often the decision on which one to use is based on what's in it. So we're going to use the brown corpus for tagging because it has those tags like I need a set of tagged data, here's brown, right? Um, but then let's say I want to look at data across time, I might be really interested in the news corpus, okay, or the inaugural address corpus. So sometimes the question will allow you to know what data set is the most appropriate for your classification or your uh, sentiment analytic. So just some other options. Oh, here's a, a better answer to your question using if they have a README. So you could do brown.readme to see. Um, I bet you it gives you the help back, but that might be another option. So we've talked about all of these. This absolute path will tell you where it's hidden on your computer in case you need to reinstall it. <laughs> Mainly encoding. Ooh, sorry. I got excited. Encoding here is um, the encoding of the file, which will make more sense next week, but this is like Latin, UTF, Unicode. Uh, that might change whether or not you think your computer can open it. Okay. Open will do next week as well. Um, root allows you to tell it where, where the file is on your computer. All right. So, um, what I think here is that sometimes it's a little too easy. If, uh, like when people get to the end of the semester, they're like, okay, I'm just going to use brown because it's the only thing I know. But I want you to think about what the options might be because there is way more out there than what is built into NLTK. And NLTK is getting kind of old. Like it doesn't update as much as there are corpora. Okay. So I want to um, do a quick um, promotion for my friend's work, which is the language Goldmind. Um, and he has a list of corpora, if you click data, and you can look at each one and what's in them. Um, and he and I are working together right now talking about what we need. We want to add a list on the side here on whether or not they're free, because not every corpus is freely accessible. Okay, so like the TV News Archive, I think, is. And so it explains a lot of these different data sets by keyword. Now, I want to briefly talk about my own research. So if you go to the lab database, okay. uh, we're going to load. Shiny's a little slow today. Um, we have a similar data set. You can search the database that has it broken down a little bit more even than um, Bodo's corpus, where I could specifically pick a language. So let's say I'm actually interested in, uh, let's pick a fun one. Let's go Korean today. Um, I could find all the corpus pieces that are in Korean, and unfortunately there's not that many, there's only three. Okay. But I also could look at what data I want. So am I interested in, meaning, semanticity, right? I could pull those and then I could pull only the ones that have that in, let's go British English, and so there's only one. So we have um, data sets that, or our website shows you kind of like a searchable data list and we just have more data than the other one. So we're trying to join forces to make this a little better. Okay. And so there's not just English, there is more out there than English, that's what I'm trying to say. Let me do a couple more slides and then we'll take a break and let you guys ask any um, 
uh, homework questions. I know I've seen a couple come across my email and that was my goal tomorrow. But if you're here tonight, you can ask them. Um, let me do just, let me see, where are we at? A couple more slides so we're catch back up. Oh, this word list thing. Just like two or three more. Okay. Um, so this last section really is more about, um, instead of large body of text, it's more about dealing with structured data, which is more about lexical resources. So the, the end of this section is about WordNet. WordNet is one of my favorite things. So you get to hear me get all excited when I get to talk about WordNet. Um, and these are corpora are more handy when you are interested in pairing. So one way to do maybe a sentiment analysis is to take the list of words that we have. So there are large databases that include how people feel about words. Are they positive or are they negative? Okay, so you can look at the individual words themselves and not just an entire paragraph. Okay. And to do that, I have to have some sort of lexicon of my data and the lexicon of ratings and merge them together. Okay. And so to even explain what is a, what is a lexicon, right? It's a sort of definition for our mental dictionary, okay. unlike our mental diary, which is uh, our episodic memory where we know the things that happen to us. Our lexicon is our sort of set of semantic meanings. It's a dictionary. That might contain the definition of the word, the part of speech, this sense disambiguation, which is like understanding when bank is a money institution and when bank is a river. Morphemes, which is the different ways that that verb can be conjugated or different ways to make words into plurals. So the plural of moose is still moose, which makes me nuts, right? For ge goose, it's geese, but for moose, it is not meese. Okay. Um, phonological information, the way it sounds, how words sounded out. I was Some friends of mine on Twitter were arguing about Canadians pronouncing the word pasta. Um, Still trying to figure this out, but phonemes or orthographic, the way the word looks when it's printed on the page. Okay. So how it's spelled. Mouse. Okay. So each lexical entry in a dictionary includes what's called a head word or a lemma. And these are the, like the root word. The word that you would see in a literal dictionary if you opened Merriam-Webster, if you still had a print version or you pulled it up on the internet. That is usually the, the main lookup. Right? So if I looked up uh, mouse in the dictionary, it's going to have mouse as the main one and mice as the plural. So the head word is mouse. Uh, it would do a sense this definition. So mouse might be a literal little bitty animal. It might be my computer mouse that's being dumb tonight. Um, and it might be a part of speech. Those are both nouns. And so it's got the list of all the different ways that the words can be used. WordNet has this kind of structure. Um, to confuse you even more, there's a lemma. Lemma is the head word, right? The main root word. Lexeme is the um, name of all the other words that are possible with the same meaning. So mouse to mice is a lexeme. There's still the same meaning. It's still the same animal. You just added the extra emphasis of uh, more than one. So run would be the lemma. Runs, ran, and running are also all lemmas, are, are the lexemes, the same meaning but different conjugated verb forms. And um, I don't know why homonyms is on the same slide, but homonyms are words that are spelled the same so homo meaning same, nim for spelling. And homonyms are a problem <laughs> because they're spelled the same. They might be pronounced differently, like read and read, or they might have completely different word meanings. Okay, so the wind is the thing that blows. But to wind, um, like your watch, if you still have a watch that winds, okay, spelled the same, pronounced differently, totally different meanings. So homonyms are um, an issue for computer processing because it was literally the same set of characters. How are we supposed to determine which one is the most accurate 